Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Uh, if you have it, let me know by saying amen. amen. It reads this way. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but a little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share today from the idea an open door. An open door. Um, when you heard me say open door, like what popped into your mind? Even as I was reading through the revelation, like you, you hear an open door, what popped into your mind? Anything pop into your mind? Some of y'all were like, what in the world does God do with New Year's? Um, maybe nothing. But as I thought about an open door, it took me back to my childhood. Like my childhood, it seemed like our front door was always open. Right? It was always open. It, it, it typically had a screen door, what some of us would call a storm door. Have a storm door there. And that door was like the gateway to joy and happiness. Right? It was the thing that either kept me inside or gave me the way to go outside. And once I was outside, you know, that was a time when you played from sun up to sundown. Uh, you had to drink water out of the faucet or the spigot or the water hose, depending on where y'all came from. Some of y'all, amen, always had a glass, amen. Well, <laughs> some of us, they wouldn't let us back in the house. So if you were going to get some, it was going to be out of that water hose, right? But, but it, it also could be the, the gateway to blessing or cursing. Right, because you could do a lot of things with that door, but when I was growing up, one of the things you couldn't do, do was keep going in and out of it. Right, stop running in and out of my house. Stop running in and out of my screen door. Pick one. You either stay in or stay out. Right, and if you're like me, we always opted to stay out and try to figure out how you're going to sneak some cold water from the inside. Right, um... An open door. That, that door was either going to be one that was going to bless you or it could be one that was going to force you to, to stay inside and miss out on all of the wonderful um, activity that's going on the other place. I mean, going, on, you know, going out as, as others were playing. Church, with that as a backdrop, the Lord tells this church at Philadelphia that before them is an open door. This church was about 28 miles southeast of the one before the church in Sardis. This church, we, we know this name, Philadelphia. We have a city in our country that's named after it. We know it's the city of brotherly love where the love of the brothers was, was in view. Right? It was named after a, a pagan king, but it was there that there was a church. In fact, turns out that historically the, the history of Christian presence is still there in that area. And Jesus himself describes himself as the one who has the key of David. Many people don't like to have keys. Certainly not having keys in the church is thought to be a blessing because if you have keys at a church, that means you have authority. But even more than having authority, you have responsibility, like to lock the building, to unlock the building, to be here when ministry starts and to be there when ministry closes. And a lot of times folks don't want keys because of the responsibility that comes along with it. But here, Christ describes himself as the one who has the key of David. He is the one who has, who is the rightful heir of the Davidic lineage that Israel was so familiar with. He is the one who has the authority to rule. And his authority is so complete that he says that he is the one who opens doors and no one will shut them. 
He's the one who closes doors and no one opens. Brothers and sisters, I dare say just from the outset that many of us would find more peace in our life. We would find even more quietness in our soul if we would just accept the fact that there are times when God will close doors in your life. That there are going to be opportunities that you see and you feel like it is uniquely tailored for you and your situation. And instead of giving you a first class ticket through it, God is going to close it. And a lot of us have spent a lot of time trying to crowbar open a door that God has closed. You tried to see for it and blow it open. You've tried to pray it open. And there's no amount of prayer, crowbarring, or see foring that can open a door that God has closed. What we need to accept that in God closing some doors, he has shielded us perhaps from the worst thing that could happen. Right, And it's not you dying, it's you walking away from him. It could be that the Lord is shielding you and saving you from yourself. And so he has closed some doors in order to open other doors that are better suited to get you to be where he wants you to be. But watch this, also to be who he wants you to be. He says he is the one who opens doors that no one shuts and he closes doors that no one can open. But brothers and sisters, as we embark upon this new year on this first Sunday in January, I really do believe in my heart of hearts, and I shared this with the congregation at our New Year's Eve service, that I believe the Lord is doing something. I really believe in my heart of hearts that he is amassing people here at the church to serve and to work because there is a great assignment that he is laying before us to accomplish for his name's sake. He put it in my heart that before you, meaning our congregation, the ministry, the, the body of Christ, before you is an open door. So what does it mean to say that the Lord has given you, has given me, has given us an open door. I think it means this at least. That the Lord has given us an open door for ministry. For service, for reaching others with the good news of Jesus Christ. And I dare say that it is a door that will remain open until the Lord closes it. There's nothing the enemy can do to stop it. Jesus alone is the one who opens that door for us. And if he's propped it open, he intends for us not to marvel at the open door, but to walk in it. To understand this idea of an open door, we've got to look at a couple passages, a few verses, in order to unpack this for us that we might truly understand what God means as he's talking to the church at Philadelphia, telling them for them there's an open door. He says in Acts 14, verse 7, he's talking about the apostle Paul, and Paul had returned from one of his missionary journeys and had returned back to Antioch of Syria, and it's there in chapter 14, verse 20. And it says, and when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Here, God had opened up a door of opportunity for the Apostle Paul to shift their ministry from uh, uh, initially targeting Jews to now being able to minister to those who were outside of the Jewish diaspora. These were men and women of, of all very ethnic backgrounds. God had given them the opportunity to preach the gospel to them so that they might be saved. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9, Paul shares his, his travel plans with the church at Corinth, and he says to them, But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. He was explaining to this the church at Corinth, the Corinth that had all of these blessings, I'm sorry, all of these gifts and talents and skill. And he was informing them that a wide door for effective work had opened. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, Paul is saying again to the same congregation, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Now, even though this was a clear opportunity for ministry that the Lord had opened up to the Apostle Paul, Paul nevertheless had the liberty to decide how to manage the opportunity. That even though God had opened up a door for him, the timing, the manner, the approaches, the strategies were all left to him because he said, my spirit was not at rest. And so I decided to do something different, notwithstanding the fact that the door was open. Colossians chapter 4, verse 3, the Apostle Paul asks the church at Colossae to pray for him. Specifically, he says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Brothers and sisters, what is it that you conclude from hearing those four verses as it relates to this door being open. How is it that you see it? As I read these verses together, I believe that the idea of an open door is this, is that God has intentionally presented us with an opportunity for effective work of ministry, thereby declaring the word of God to others, and he has given us some measure of control in how we do it. Say it another way, that God has not just put us on his corner to boast about being on the corner. That God has put us uniquely in this community, not far from the highway and not far from the neighborhood, with a school in our backyard and new houses and development coming. He has given us an opportunity to pour into the lives of God's highest creation by putting us on a corner where the cross, the cross of Christ can be lit up at night and during the day. Day, the smiles of Christ's people can light up a city as they go out into the world to declare the mysteries of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, before you stands an open door, and before us a door is open. God has given us an open door, and there are some things I can tell you that are coming down the pipeline that will help position us to do greater works for God's glory, but we got to take advantage of it. We've got to be ready, and we've got to be willing, and we've got to be courageous in order to take advantage of the open doors that God has for us. And in order to take advantage of the open doors that the God has for us, corporately and individually because if he's opening the door of the church he's necessarily opening some doors for the individuals in the church and so you have to be ready we all have to be ready for when those doors open to move it's not the business of a door to be marveled at but in order to encourage travel doors open to allow folks to go in and out but they close in order to keep the bad stuff out and the good stuff in you've got to be be prepared and ready to take advantage of the blessing and favor that is coming our way to do it rightly. We have to shift our thinking, brothers and sisters. We have to shift our thinking from assuming that an open door is solely for us to come up. We got to stop thinking that God has made a way out of no way and open up a door for us to escape or to walk in to our blessing as solely for us to come up. Right? We got to shift our thinking to understand that God opening up a door for us is not just to bless us materially or to improve our material situations or simply to bless us personally. We've got to come to understand that our personal and our material benefit and blessing is only incidental to the real thing. Like there's God, God is doing something greater in you and through you and it turns out that you getting a raise or you getting a promotion is just incidental to the main assignment that God has for you. 
God is going to use you to do something great in the world. It turns out you might need to have greater access. And in order to have greater access, you might need to have a promotion so that you can have greater authority to affect things. It's not just so you can have more money in your account. What are you going to do to bless the kingdom with the money you got? We have to shift our thinking. We have to see that our personal and material blessing is only incidental to the main objective of spreading the gospel. It's not for us to boast about being blessed. It is about accomplishing the work. And so again, if you get a raise, if you make the team, if you move to a new spot, it's not only that you will benefit from those changes, But it's understanding that they play a part in fulfilling your ministry purpose in the world. How many people spend their entire lives chasing the same stuff year after year and still don't have satisfaction? Last year, you was like, if I get this promotion, you got it. You still ain't satisfied. This year, you need another one. (laughs) Right? Last year, if I get this house... You got it. Now you still think it's too small. I throw some of that junk away. <laughs> Try that first. Right? It is, it is, there is something greater that God is doing, and all of the blessing and favor that we experience and receive materially just happens to be incidental. We got to come to see that our personal and material blessings only help us make a greater impact. The reason you might have more room in your house is because you can host a small group. Right? Or you might be the spot that a traveling missionary can go to when they can't afford a hotel. Right? That, that God may be blessing you not so that you can, you know, compare yourself to your siblings. Right? Y'all already blood. How close can you get? I ain't got to impress you. I remember when you was running around with no clothes on. Like, I don't have to impress you. Right? Maybe God is, is blessing you in order to be a blessing, right? to make a greater impact. And so to make a greater impact, we must do something. We must walk boldly into those open doors that God has for us. We got to walk boldly. We have to walk boldly. What does it mean to be bold? To be bold means that a person had, or, you know, sometimes it's an, an adjective that applies to animals too, but of course we're dealing with, with folks today, right? To be bold means to be confident, right? It's to be courageous. To be bold means that someone has shown an ability or a capacity to take risk, right? Even in the face of danger or, you know, somebody has... Has, has done the analysis, the quantitative analysis, and has concluded that taking the risky step is far more beneficial than doing nothing, or God forbid, going back in the other direction. And so even though they may be fearful, they nevertheless move forward boldly, right? To walk through the doors that God has opened for you and for us, we must do so boldly. And not just intermittently or sparingly. Boldness needs to describe our our ongoing, consistent mindset, our ongoing and consistent behavior. We must act boldly as a pattern. I didn't say arrogantly, cockily, mean, stuck up, right, conceited, uh, uh, rude. I didn't say that. I said bold. You can be bold without being a jerk. You can be bold without blowing out somebody else's candle so that yours can burn brighter. You can be bold and courageous without tearing other folk down. Right? I said bold, not mean. Right? We must be bold as we walk through these doors. And to really get a, another idea about what this boldness looks like in the life of a believer, again, we'll look at the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 30, uh, we are shown that the Apostle Paul preached boldly at Damascus. The Bible says in verse 27 of chapter 9 of Acts, says, But Barnabas took him 
and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, meaning Paul had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he, Paul, had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. Paul had just got saved good. Had just got his sight back, having been knocked off his quote-unquote high horse on the road to Damascus. And the first thing that he started doing when he got his sight back was start preaching boldly. I figure anybody that can take my sight whenever he want to, I need to get up and start preaching boldly too. <laughs> I came to destroy the church, not no more. I got my sight back. I can see for real now. And he started preaching boldly. Acts 14 verses 1 through 3. The Bible tells us that Paul and Barnabas were at Iconium. And it says in verse 3, So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done at their hands. Paul and his buddy Barnabas were out preaching uh, the, the good news about Christ and speaking to those who would listen to them. And as they spoke at Iconium, they spoke boldly concerning the things of God. And God authenticated their messaging by allowing them to work signs and wonders. There were miracles and blessing that accompanied those things that they were teaching about in order to authenticate the message. Christ himself was showing all the onlookers that these guys are legit because I am authenticating their message by these miracles. As they spoke boldly, right, these things happened. In Acts 19, verses uh, 8 through 10, Paul acted boldly in Ephesus. There were folks trying to kill Paul. That's, uh, he got much respect for me. This is one of the few dudes who know folks trying to get him, and instead of leaving the city and going somewhere else all the time, he stayed. This was if boldness had a picture, it would have Paul's face on it. Here in this passage, the apostle Paul preached in the synagogue at Ephesus. All the Jews got mad. He took all the new believers and stayed in town another two years in order to teach these folk. That's bold. I'd be like, y'all meet me over on the back side of the lake, and we're going to do what we do. But if y'all hear horses, let me know. But that's not what Paul did. He stayed in the city two years teaching these new disciples, and he taught them with boldness. Brothers and sisters, I think we can see whether it's teaching or speaking or preaching or serving boldly. You cannot do this without trusting God. Amen. You're not going to stand in the face of certain death in your own strength preaching a message you don't believe in. Right? right. You're going to need the Lord. That's the only way that you, cannot, you and I can walk through these open doors boldly. We have to do it this way. And this boldly for me is an acronym for these words, believing our Lord daily. We got to be bold. We got to believe our Lord daily. We have to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ daily. Not just Wednesday and Sunday, not on the days when we have to take a certificating exam, not on the days when we're trying to pass the bar, not on the days when we're trying to get our series, fill in the blank license, but every day, not on the day when our baby is sick and not on the day when we're going in for an interview. Every day, we've got to believe our Lord daily. Please understand and please make sure that you understand that I'm not asking you, do you believe in God? I'm asking you, do you believe God? I'm not asking you whether or not you believe he exists. I assume you know he exists. That's why you're here. My question is, do you believe him? Do you believe him when he says before you stands an open door? And if I open the door, nobody can shut it. Do you believe him when he says, I am the God who heals? Do you believe him when he says that I am the God who provides? I am the water in dry places. That I am the bread for the hungry. That I am that I am. That I am life. That I I am promise that I am blessing, that I am favor, that I can do anything but fail. Is there anything too hard for God? Do you believe him when he tells you, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that weeping may endure for a night? Hallelujah. But joy comes in the morning. Do you believe him? 
Do you believe God? The only way that we can go boldly through the doors that the Lord has opened for us, we got to believe him. You got to hold on to him. You got to tie a knot in the end and hold on because you believe God. As a church, I believe the Lord has called us to, to walk boldly primarily three ways this year. The first is to win and sin. That as we go to those doors, we're not just going to look at the door and talk about how wide open it is. We need to go through it. We need to win and sin. We need to go out of these walls prepared to evangelize those who are desperately searching for answers. To tell a dying world that there's life in Jesus Christ. We need to win them. And when we win them, we need to bring folks back and teach them how to go win somebody else. There's no reason that anybody that's part of the body of Christ should be saved 10 years and 15 years and 45 years and not know how to share the gospel. You ought not have to drag nobody from Garland all the way over here to try to get them saved at Antioch. Right there somewhere between the lettuce and the crackers, you ought to be able to tell them in, in, in your favorite grocery store how to get saved. At the park, right between throwing the ball in the bounds and out of bounds. You ought to be able to tell them how to get saved. We need to win and sin. Secondly, we got to reach and teach. Part of the external blessing that we can attain and achieve, rather, is the fact that we have been blessed in our congregation. That we have creative types, and we have scientific types, and we have entrepreneurs, and we have uh, uh, people who are high-ranking officials in a number of areas. we got teachers at all levels. We have folks who have trades at all kinds of levels. We have knowledge and insight that affects directly the working of ministry. Why would we hoard all of that stuff to ourselves? We should be reaching out of the walls and pouring into others who are are open and teaching and serving and preaching in the name of Christ and showing them how to be great at what it is that they do. We should be reaching, but we should also be teaching. We should be teaching the folks who are inside of the walls. We should be helping people grow in their discipleship. Right? And part of growing in discipleship is a responsibility to make yourself available. It does no good to talk about there being an open door and God is able to teach and grow and mature in this and you're not availing yourselves of it. So to be taught means you got to show up. And to be taught, there needs to be a teacher. And so we have this responsibility to not only teach ourselves but to reach others with what we've come to know. And so who was the last person you discipled? Who was the last person you showed the Christian ropes? Don't fall for the lie that you got to get a Ph.D. or a D. men to disciple somebody. You just need to have gone to Bible study last Wednesday, and they just needed to have missed it. <laughs> if you got one more lesson than they got, you can disciple them. Who was the last person you discipled? Here's the third thing. I believe God is calling our church to blaze in praise. The informal definition of blaze means to do something in an impressive way. We ought to be blazing out in the community. We should be doing stuff to such a degree that when we miss a meeting, the whole city ought to just stop. <laughs> you ought to go dark because we ain't do our part. I asked our church years ago if our building burned down, would the community even miss us? We should be blazing to such an extent that if we didn't show up, the whole city felt it. This whole region skipped a beat. We need to be doing it in an impressive way. Not that folks could marvel at Antioch, but that folks might see your good works and glorify your God who is in heaven. People should be running to Jesus because of how we are doing the stuff that we're doing. They should want to know him more. They should want to know him better. We should be blazing in what we do, but we should be praising all the while. Y'all, it's tough out here in these church streets. Boy, receipts everywhere. Ain't nobody safe. Ask Cat. Ain't nobody safe. 
It's all kind of stuff going out. So we need to come here to retool, to get rejuvenated, to be re-inspired, right, to go out and do the great work. We should be coming here and praising, right, whether you're laying prostrate or you find your little corner to get what you get or you're sitting there rocking and weeping, but you're engaging with God. We should be praising God every chance that we get. Setting the tone as well as setting the example. Right? We should be blazing and praising. Well, I don't know much about that, but they love Jesus. We hear it all outside. Well, let's show them outside too. Don't let it just be in here. But let's live it out there. Right? So how will you be bold this year? Like I said, I heard earlier yesterday I don't want this to be a New Year's resolution, right? I don't want this, this uh, to be just a to-do list for the first week of January. That's why we, we don't do no New Year's resolution. Y'all know how they last, about 12 minutes <laughs> until tomorrow, right? No, 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 we don't want to set any New Year's resolution. This is just our commitment that just happens to start this year, right? How are you going to believe our Lord daily? this year this may mean that you start serving this may mean that you finally teach something that you you finally embark upon that ministry that the Lord has placed in your heart but you've been desperately trying to find somebody else to do it and you're the only one that catches the vision how are you going to live more for God this year how are you going to sacrifice this year for some of us, it may be to say yes to the Lord. You know he's been tugging at your heart and he's been pulling at you to get involved, to put your hand on the gospel plow and, and not look back, to stop making excuses and, and exempting yourself from things that he's called you to, to be plugged into and to get involved in. Maybe it's, it's to give, finally. Maybe it's to to use your, your, your gifting, your talent, in order to help somebody else that's struggling in that area. I want to challenge you to surrender your heart to the Lord and say yes to him. In whatever way that he's been tugging at your heart, say yes to him. Don't try to look for another reason why you can't do it. If you're too busy, you might just be too busy. It might just be that you're doing some things that God hadn't called you to do. It may be that there's some things in your agenda that God hadn't told you to put on there. That was your ego. Right? Maybe, maybe you need to make more room for God so that you can do, really do what he's called you to do. Will you do that today? Because before you stands an open door, and God doesn't open the door just so that we can marvel in it, but he wants us to walk in it and to walk through it. Will you go through that door today? For some folks, the door that's in view is the door of your heart. And the same book of the Revelation says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God has been knocking on your heart. He's been knocking on some of our hearts so much that the very sound of the echo causes some disturbance within us. It's starting to get uncomfortable because you know the knock is getting louder. And you're afraid that if you give in, you're going to lose everything. You will. You're going to lose all the stuff that doesn't matter. You're going to lose all those things that ensnared you and kept you in bondage. Because the Bible says who the son says free is free indeed. You're going to lose all of those chains. No, you're going to still have some problems. On this side, you'll have tribulation. Right? There's some things we're going to take to the grave. There's some struggles that you're going to struggle with until you meet Jesus face to face. But he'll help you through them. Behold, he's standing at the door of your heart and knocking. Is there someone here today that will open up that door and let him in? 
for you. It may not be to embark upon ministry for you. It may be to really start a serious relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? God is not in the business of, of throwing things in your face. He's not trying to shame you. But he loves you too much to leave you where you are like you are. Why be average? When God wants you a part of his family. Will you come and be a part of his family today? Jesus Christ, the son of God. The one who's of the Davidic lineage. The Messiah, the one who was prophesied from page one to the end of the book. He came and lived the life like we did, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And in his perfection, he was brought before Pilate and Herod. There was no sin to be found in him. There was no wrong in him. And yet, they beat him and scourged him and condemned him to crucifixion. And it was there on Golgotha's hill, suspended between heaven and earth, in between these two thieves that he cried out it is finished every drop of blood that he shed was more than enough to wipe your slate clean it was there on Calvary's cross that our Lord died a brutal death bearing in his body sins that I committed and sins that you committed and sins that we committed he was put in a borrowed tomb they rolled the stone in front of the hole. Oh, but three days later, while the dew was still on the grass, when the birds were just warming up their vocal cords and the angels were still stretching out their wings, the Bible says early on Sunday morning, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the soon coming King, the Messiah, the great I am, the rose of Sharon, the water from a rock, the bread for the hungry. He got up with all power of heaven and earth in his hands. Power to save the worst of us. Power to save the best of us. Power to save the least of us. Power to save the greatest of us. You might feel like the greatest sinner, but I'm here to tell you, there's room here for you. Will you come today?